so before construction of the the dams on the river it was it was home for us for thousands of years we lived on the river we fished at kettle falls and it was a very important spiritual and, and cultural part of our our life our way of life and and with the construction of those dams that was taken away from us for for over 80 years now and and the importance of bringing that back not only again for the tribes but for for everybody is is that connection my ancestors relationship with salmon is since time in memorial. We have uh, known the salmon since the beginning. Um, it's in our creation stories, it's in our oral stories, and uh, that beautiful fish sustained my ancestors and um, until we had them had the salmon no more. You know, we've lived off this land for millennia, for thousands of years, and uh, developed a relationship and a way of life and understanding and identity that's based on our relationship with the animals and, and stuff that are occurring. Uh, one of those major pieces for the Coeur tribe are salmon. I don't think the tribe's ever ever surrendered to the, surrendered to the loss of those salmon. I think, I think it's always been in the back of our minds that one day we would we would bring them home. And, and UCUD is a, is a centralized organization that works for those five tribes that bring them together on those common issues. Hundreds of thousands of salmon used to return to the Spokane River. Uh, the tribe used to harvest, historically, tens of thousands of fish, ranging from all the way to Little Falls, all the way to Spokane Falls, at different fishing locations along the way, and from the Spokane's tributaries. Seeing the salmon across the whole river, so plentiful, so large that you could just walk across the river on their backs. Certainly the dominant runs of salmon within the Hangman Creek watershed were Chinook and Steelhead. And we still see um, remnant Steelhead populations in the form of resident red band trout in the headwaters of Hangman Creek. Um, when it comes to Chinook, it was likely spring Chinook. We're moving into the upper watershed and some, some summer Chinook were, were spawning in the lower part of the watershed. And it, as far as numbers of those fish, I, I would just say that historical accounts, you know, estimate that upwards of a thousand fish were some type harvested within a day in Lower Hangman Creek. When we look at salmon decline within the Columbia River Basin, often the four H's come up, harvest, hatcheries, habitat, and hydrodevelopment. And the Upper Columbia and Spokane Rivers were really impacted uh, originally by harvest from lower river commercial fisheries and the cannery operations that targeted the June hogs, the large Chinook salmon that came up to the Spokane River. And then, of course, hydro development. First with the construction of Little Falls Dam, which originally had fish passage. However, when the subsequent dams on the Spokane River were constructed, they started to block fish passage to those really productive habitats. The main stem river downstream of the city of Spokane, Hangman Creek, and the Little Spokane River. And this was all between the 1910s and the 1930s. When Grant Cooley was constructed, completed in 1941, that was really kind of the, the final nail in the coffin for salmon in our region. And then Little Falls Dam is um, built and blocks the salmon. Then Grand Coulee is built and totally blocks the salmon, cuts off the salmon from our tribal people. The vision's always been there. Um, the Coeur d'Alene tribe has never forgot salmon. You know, it was always a part of their culture and it always will be. And although it wasn't until the last 15 years or so that that started to gain momentum regionally really started to put the pedal down and start to get some momentum on salmon recovery back in about 2010, 2012, when the tribes in the Columbia River Basin all got together and figured that this should be a, a major policy change and a major goal within the basin is to recover salmon above Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee Dams. We understand the reality of all situations since uh, previous centuries that uh, our neighbors were here and we have always welcomed them with open arms. We realize that a century's worth of damage done to our waterways and our fish, we alone cannot uh, rectify the situation. Uh, we understand that there are lots of parties involved with different interests 
and we understand that we cannot get to our ultimate goals, we cannot accomplish that without our neighbors, without our friends, without our adversaries. And it's going to take a large group of people, a large number of parties to fix a century's worth of damage. We still envision a day where there are sea-run fish in the stream behind me. That is the ultimate goal, and we will not waver on that goal. When it comes to restoration, we try to take that, that holistic approach and, and look at how all those different ecosystems tie into one another, how they support one another, and, and then what actions can we take to improve conditions so we can have a home for salmon when they do finally return to Hangman Creek. Upper Columbia tribes, including the Spokane tribe, are pursuing a phased approach to reintroduction. It's described within the Northwest Power and Conservation Council's 2014 Columbia River Basin Fish and Wildlife Program. Phase one involved a lot of tabletop exercises, looking at existing data for habitat availability, suitability, as well as fish passage technologies that are available that might be applied to Spokane River and Columbia Main Stem dams. Phase two is real research studies that evaluate salmon survival as they migrate out of the Spokane River and down the Columbia and as adults coming back where we put acoustic tags, radio tags and pit tags in fish and monitor their behavior, survival, sources of mortality to determine where we can make improvements and bring these salmon back. And phase three is permanent reintroduction. Depending on the results from phase two, We'll look at the feasibility, what improvements, what sort of infrastructure might be required to have permanent reintroduction and reestablish populations within the Spokane River and Upper Columbia River watersheds. When we look at Spokane River dams and the outmigration timing of salmon and steelhead, those fish are outmigrating during peak flows when the river is going over the spillways and not necessarily the turbines. So survival may be high enough to support a population where we may not even need fish passage at specific projects. When we talk about creating water quality that can support salmon, we need to get at those root causes like nutrient input, like high levels of erosion, um, solar radiation within the stream. We need to start addressing those issues so we can get a handle on providing cold water and dissolved oxygen for salmon when they return to the basin. The Spokane River provides a really unique opportunity for salmon and steelhead, especially as we face climate change. In-stream flows are fed by the Spokane Valley Rath and Prairie Aquifer. That groundwater is consistently cool and provides consistent flow to the river. So these fish have cold, clean water available to them year-round, particularly in the summer when we see temperatures escalate for instance, in this year, into the triple digits for an extended period of time. The Spokane River is water. It is sacred. Our, our people since time immemorial knew that the Creator provided this environment for us. And it wasn't provided to us so that we owned it or that we were to take it and do whatever we want with it but the Creator gave it to us to take care of it. During these cultural and ceremonial and educational releases, um, I was involved in some of them here, uh, a year and a half, two years ago, and, and to see the salmon swimming in those waters at, at Kettle Falls is uh, very hard to describe the emotions and the feelings to, to see the, the ripples of those salmon swimming, <coughs> swimming away from us as we released them. It's been 80 years since they've been in those waters, and, and it, you know, we turned them loose and it was like they was never gone. That relationship is, is something that um, is still there. That relationship stands there waiting for us to bring it back. So as we look at uh, being able to increase and, and return the health of our people, one of the key puzzles to that are, are the elements uh, of the natural world around us, and that includes salmon, that includes the red band that are all throughout Hangman, 
uh, and our ability to be able to make sure that we restore those and get those healthy and functioning uh, from our perspective is a, a part of our wholesome health uh, for the tribe as, as a whole. And um, as we've mentioned, uh, important not just for the tribe, but for the entire region. Spokane isn't aware or doesn't recognize the value that salmon can provide to the community, to the ecosystem. Being a subsidy of marine derived nutrients to aquatic riparian and upland habitats. Uh, when you look at uh, economically what what uh, good healthy salmon run would entail and what it would incur, uh, you're talking about providing benefits that are just beyond you know the Coeur d'Alene tribe as well. The economy that can be supported by recreation, tourism, fishing, restoration industry, and the restoration of identity, not just for the Spokane tribe but for the city. From our perspective, it's not about just doing what's right for our own people. It's about doing what's right for everybody around, around us and making sure we, we're finding ways to celebrate life together. And so from our perspective, as we go about and do all this work, uh, even though sometimes it can be super challenging, uh, we look at it as being, being beneficial to the entire region, not just the Coeur d'Alene tribe. I'm extremely optimistic the salmon reintroduction can work in the Spokane and the upper Columbia rivers. Not because I'm an idealist and want to wish good things upon the world, but because we've seen it work. Over the past several years, the tribe has performed small-scale cultural and educational releases, where pit tag juveniles have been released to the Spokane River and its tributaries, and we've monitored those fish as they outmigrate down the Columbia River. We've seen unexpectedly high survival as those fish encounter Columbia River dams below Chief Joe. And we've had four adults out of 750 juveniles return back to the Columbia Basin, one of which made it as far as the Chief Joseph Hatchery Ladder. As far as that fish could possibly have swam, it did to reach its home waters. To think that salmon can persist, even in the conditions of the Columbia River, like they are now, with so much hydro development, so much fishing pressure, and everything fighting against those salmon and for their ability to still hold on and in some cases support natural production that can sustain a, a small population gives me hope. It gives me hope that even the conditions that you see in parts of Hangman Creek that salmon could overcome. We have to do our part. Our ancestors did their part. Now we need to do our part. And our part is respecting the environment, um, keeping it clean, honoring it, and not taking advantage of it. That's, that's important. Otherwise, it's not going to be here for, for our future generations. That feeling to see him at Kettle Falls is, was, was amazing. And, and something as a tribal citizen I'll, I'll never forget. So, you know, Technically, the salmon are home, and we have to continue to provide them those opportunities to uh, continue to do what, what they've done for thousands of years, and that's, that's provide us with substances, with, nourish, with nourishment, with those cultural ties uh, to the fish. It's, it's just something that we're, you know, as tribal citizens, we'll never, we'll never give up on. We'll never quit trying to bring them home.